All right, guys, we are here at the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, and we have some amazing interviews lined up for you already. We have Sierra Space ready to go, and the guys are going to be amazed with some of the new developments that have happened at that company and what they're planning for their upcoming space station, especially in the medical field. We've also got Lockheed Martin going to be talking about nuclear propulsion with them amongst many other things. On top of that, we also have Airbus and their new involvement with a brand new space station, the Star Lab that I've talked about many times on this channel. But now we get to hear all of the exciting details from Airbus themselves. All of this combined with amazing scenes like this RL-10 engine here from Aerojet Rocketdyne, which is one of the longest lived and most established engines engines in the history of space flight. Let me tell you something, in these series of videos, you're going to get some content unlike anything you've seen before. Can't wait to bring it to you, so let's get going. Folks, we have had many exciting interviews in the course of our visit here at the Space Symposium. Lots of companies exploring lots of amazing projects, but none are so well established and have such an amazing history as Lockheed Martin. And we are joined today by one of the top dogs in this organization. Would you be so kind, sir, as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Thanks, Jordan. I'm, I'm Gary Napier. I'm with the Lockheed Martin Space, uh, working the communications as a communication spokesperson, but I love to talk about commercial civil space. Well, let me tell you, as the viewers know right now, one of the main hooks that I had for this video is the fact that we were going to be talking about nuclear propulsion. We're going to start off with that. First of all, tell me about what future projects and what projects are is Lockheed Martin working on now with Draco and such, yeah. and, and what can we expect to see happen with nuclear thermal and other solutions in the near future? We're at a really exciting time right now about nuclear space technology. You know, nuclear and space have been around for quite a while. Um, Lockheed Martin has a long heritage with building the radioisotope thermoelectric generators, the RTGs. You know, we built the, the, the Mars landers for the, the, the Viking landers, and they had RTGs on them back in 1976. And we built just about all of the RTGs, whether it's New Horizon or Cassini or the Voyagers or Ulysses, um, up to the last uh, two rovers, which um, Aerojet Rocketdyne built those. But this is a different technology. This isn't that radioisotope plutonium fuel. This is a different fuel using uranium. We call it HALU. And, and it's really a, a, a neat point right now. There, there, we've got three different programs in this portfolio that we're starting to build out there. They're all customer funded. The one that's, that's really exciting right now is nuclear thermal propulsion. And this is a, a study contract with DARPA, the, the, the Department of Defense, and NASA. It's about a 50-50 investment between those companies. And actually, Lockheed Martin is putting a lot of our own money in it, IRAD money, because we were so invested in it. Nuclear thermal propulsion is about taking a fission reactor, um, creating you know, a, a really high heat source, 
running a cryogenic over right now. Right now we're, we're thinking liquid hydrogen could maybe be a different cryogenic. Mommy run it over that reactor, flashes really quick to a, to a, a gas, spew it out a nozzle, you never ignite it. It's got the same power of the highest chemical engines, like a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engine, but it's two to three times more efficient. So you can keep it turned on for much, much longer at that really high power rate. Ultimately, could get humans to Mars in four months instead of that six to nine months range. Now the propellant is leaving the nozzle, I've heard numbers anywhere from nine kilometers per second to 12. Is that about right? And that that sounds about time? right. I'm not the, yeah. I'm not the tech guy. I'm not the engineer behind it, but, but it's, it's that efficiency. It goes from, you know, chemical engines are in that 400 ISP and this is getting it up into that, that 900 ISP. And it's more about that, that you got the high horsepower, but you also got that great fuel efficiency. Too, right? So I've been looking at the Jetson, for example, mm -hmm. which the viewers are looking at some B-roll of Jetson yeah. right now. Tell us a little bit about this project and, and how that fits in with your view for nuclear propulsion. All right, so Jetson's actually number two of the three we're going to talk about. Jetson, very similar fission reactor, but this time we, we're going to take that heat source and we're going to convert it into electricity through either a Stirling or a Brighton engine and get a really good, you know... 10 kilowatts of, of power, take that electric power now and run it through uh, through electric engines, um, HAL, HAL thrusters, for example. So now you don't need these massive solar arrays to create a, you know electrical propulsion. So the ISP, which I don't know what ISP of, of the electrical propulsion is up there, but you know it's up in the thousand range for uh, electrical propulsion, but you don't have to have these massive solar arrays. And, and with you know deep space exploration, you can keep these engines turned on for a long time and you can move cargo big heavy cargo far distances so Jetson is out of the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory AFRL out of um, Albuquerque the, the technology actually comes out of a, of a uh, Los Alamos study called um, Krusty as a kilowatt um, reactor study and so uh, we got a lot of partners the one thing I should mention back with both Draco but also with Jetson we have some really um, important um, um, industry partners, BWXT is, is just a, a huge uh, um, experts in the nuclear fission reactor. These are the folks that are making the nuclear reactors on the uh, you know, Navy submarine and aircraft carriers, right? And BWXT is also on our, um, our, on our Jetson program, but we also have a company called um, Space Nuclear Tech out of, out of Los Alamos, too. So we've got some really great minds up as a part of this. It sounds like an exciting stuff. project. When do you foresee we'll see? Uh, NEP or a NEP demonstrator or a uh, yeah. you know, one of these other types of solutions and how soon? Yeah, so um, Draco is actually meant we've just went through engine PDR and then we're going to be going through CDR next year and then the start of ATLO, the assembly test and launch operations in 26 and, and demonstrate a flight mission of Draco in 27. Wow. So really not far away. Three years. Yeah. It, it, it is. Amazing. Now Jetson's a little bit behind it. Jetson, the contract is to get us to a PDR stage, and there's an option to take us out to CDR. It's a lot of similar technologies. And you said there's a third. There's a third. Solution. So very similar to Jetson, where you take the, the, the fission reactor, and you convert it to electricity with, with a Stirling or Brighton engine. This time, instead of putting it on a spacecraft, we're going to land it, and we're going we're gonna to put it on a lander and land it on the moon fission surface power so now we're going to have a nice little you know nuclear fission electric power station on the surface of the moon and as you definitely know and i'm sure your viewers know the moon's nights are 14 days long of cold and then it's 14 days of sunlight and during the sunlight you know plus 250 fahrenheit nighttime minus 240 250 fahrenheit 500 degree fahrenheit swings and so it's really hard to try to survive the night let alone do any sort of operation but if you can plug in and power up and you've got unlimited 40 you know kilowatt of power capability that is what's going to enable this lunar economy and such. You can also put this down in those permanently shadowed regions down in Shackleton and the South Pole that we're hearing about so much. So solar's good, but solar can only work if it's in the sun. Now, is this a modular nuclear reactor or is this smaller than that? 
It's fairly small. It sits on a very simple lander. Think of it something kind of like an Insight Phoenix class lander that we built and went to Mars, and it was you know something that we would send to the moon. Reactor sits on right there. It actually has quite a bit of radiators. They look like solar rays um, sticking out the top radiators for that thermal management. So um, the next topic I'd like to move to real quick is um, before we move to another exciting futuristic topic would be Orion and the yeah. state of that. What do you see for the future of Orion? Is Do you think that's just going to be limited to our SLS missions for Artemis or are there other uh, purposes that Orion can serve? So we're, we're clearly on, on, the, on the early days of Orion right now in Artemis. You know, we just had that amazing, successful Artemis 1 mission and in late 22 and, and it came back and it was a, like just a nearly flawless mission beautiful we're, we're, we're working hard working crazy to fly Artemis 2 with those four amazing astronauts I've met them oh my gosh yeah. pretty yeah. cool folks right and, and so we're, we're, we're committed along with NASA to, to getting Artemis and Orion launched in September of 25 so we're not too far out maybe a month and, and whatever that is three or four months a year and three or four months right we're contracted with NASA to go all the way to Artemis 8. Wow. So we're building Orion for Artemis 8, and there's still options to build more Orions beyond that. So NASA right now is studying what they're calling their Moon to Mars initiative, and they're, they're looking at, how, you know, we, we, we all know what we have and what we need on the front side of Artemis. So we've got, we've got the crew module, the spacecraft, we've got the rocket, we've got the gateway, we a new contract on the lunar terrain vehicles. We just won, we're on a team that won yes. one of the study contracts for that, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we're, we're talking about the power system, the habitation systems, and so NASA's looking to industry to kind of figure out what all that is. But, you know, we don't know what the number of Artemis missions are, but we know there's going to be quite a few. And maybe NASA wants to get into this rhythm of doing one a year and keep them flying and doing amazing stuff and not just doing Apollo stuff and six missions and we're out, right? Right. So there's absolutely a, a, a future to Orion. Where you were asking is like, is there a future beyond Artemis? And we did, we think there is, absolutely. So, Orion certified to be uh, uh, from a from a life support standpoint to be a hundred percent sustainable for twenty one day missions with the four crew on board, and then it's easily. We've done our studies that says this thing can do a thousand days wow. with with the right. You know, now do you and I want to go sit in an SUV together no. for a thousand days? No. We wouldn't be of friends course, after that. we're not going to do an Orion to the moon by itself. It needs to be a part of, of you know, we got to have the RV and the trailer, and we got to have the storage to carry all of our water and our food and supplies. And so, of course, there's going to be habitation systems and power systems and laboratories for this, uh, you know, three year, thousand day mission. And we've done this, the early studies that says Orion absolutely can do that from a radiation standpoint and et cetera. We can, it, it clearly can be the con command module for a, for a deeper system. We've actually gone and studied this and developed a concept. We call it Mars Base Camp. It's been out there for a little while and it's a way of showing how Orion and using an Orion can get humans to Mars. And that's the topic, I, the final topic I want to talk about today is Mars Base Camp, how Orion is integrated into that system, and your vision for going to Mars versus SpaceX's vision of going to Mars. How is it different? And, I, and I'm going to allow you to yeah. make a competitive statement too. How is your way better? So Mars Base Camp is, is, is a, not only just a, a, a design system that shows how current technologies that are already proven out can be used and put together and how it can get us to Mars, but it's, it's an operational um, idea too about it. So ultimately, Mars Base Camp it would be built up out at the Lunar Gateway. We're not going to launch this massive system off the, that heavy Earth gravity well. We're going to send out these systems out to Gateway, build it up, Two Orions get integrated and a crew comes in and then ultimately, honestly, kind of Star Trek style, we push it off in that low gravity well and we get it to get it to uh, Mars. And the very first mission we say should be orbital missions. 
That's why we call it the base camp. It's like climbing Everest. So you, the, your very first, you know, climb up is at this base camp, and you set up this base, and then you can do these sorties to the summit, or in Mars, it's sorties down to the surface. But we think the very first missions need to be orbital missions. Honestly, that's how we've been exploring the solar systems for decades right. with robotics. We don't, the very first time we go to Mars, we didn't land on it. No, we, we actually flew by it. Then we started doing the land, going into orbit with the Mariner 9s, and right. then we started landing I mean then even went into orbit with the Vikings and then we started landing so we think Mars is, is the same approach it makes sense it's actually more reasonable to not have to develop the the landing technology so fast let's just go do some amazing science and prove that humans can get to Mars right now what's cool with since we introduced Mars base camp I mean Mars base camp isn't this program we're building right now this is a concept it's a vision of how to use Orion and the technologies and how to do an orbital um, you know mission lately though we've took what we just talked about with nuclear thermal propulsion and power and what we've been talking about with Orion Mars base camp and says you know I'm, Mars Base Camp can get even better now that we've got nuclear thermal propulsion. Exactly. We call it Mars Base Camp 2.0. It's nothing overly creative there. But now we're talking about using an NTP, nuclear thermal propulsion system, that can get us to Mars, you know, in four months. And there's different classes of, of, of um, you know, orbits that can get us there. So we can fly a lot of new ideas. You know, and there's new technologies in there too. Um, inflatable habitation. We're really big inflatable habitats right now, where we just got on contract to do a, a large, uh, full-scale uh, creep test with Marshall. Uh, we've been doing some burst tests. There's always some cool video out there of habitats blowing up. Yes, there are. So we definitely want to incorporate that into Mars Space Camp. So it's exciting times, man. Now, if we're talking about inflatable, real quick. Uh, yeah. Just. To there, there's a lot of people out there who are saying that it isn't safe. Tell me how you can make inflatable safe in space. Inflatables are safe in space. They're proven. They're on the space station right now. They've been up there that, for many, that many one years. Bigelow, it, Bigelow's one up yeah. there. It's still inflated. They're they're very strong from a micrometeoroid standpoint. Um, the the pressurization, um, you know, radiation. The, the, what about that? Uh, you know, as much as metallics, absolutely, absolutely. And there's other ways to, you know manage radiation more than just that thin metallic wall or this you know this stuff is, is made out of um, Vectran which is very similar to Kevlar you know bulletproof fest this, this special yarn and there's a lot of proprietary ways and whether you you weave it and how you deal with it but the reality is is we just don't see a future where you know the world is, is going to live in habitats that are limited by the size of a fairing of a rock at seven meters across. We need to have 30 meter habitation systems up there, and the only way you're going to do that is with inflatable soft goods technology. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And we also believe that this, you know, the same technology is how we're going to do habitation on the surface of the moon, right. and even the surface of Mars. You know, we we don't need to land these big, massive metallic habitation systems on the moon massive amount of weights, land it as an inflatable, blow it up, go live in it, maybe even put it on a mobile system and move that habitat around a little bit. Yeah. So, no, inflatables and soft goods are absolutely the, the way of the future. Fantastic. Well, mm -hmm. I definitely like hearing that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something. The final thing I guess I'd just like to say is that I, I see a plan. I see an amazing and exciting vision that you have with what you've just told us, the integration of Orion yeah. with nuclear thermal propulsion and Mars Base Camp to get us to the red planet. I think it's an intriguing plan, and I think it's a very interesting way, an interesting plan to put up again against Elon Musk's plan. So may the best plan win. But you know, we're, we're all in this. We've, we've all, it's not us or them or, you know, we're all in this together. I would definitely That, that company like is very, that. very integral to, yes. to the Artemis program. There's a You're lot right. of it. And there's actually 11 prime corporations in Artemis right now when you start thinking about Gateway and two human landers, um, SLS and Orion and ground systems and, and now soon to be rovers. So there's room for everybody. There's a need for everybody. And it's not just U.S., what do we have, 36 countries in the Artemis Accords now? I hear we're getting ready to sign a, a 37th one here. So it, it's, it, this isn't Apollo. This is the world's effort, the industry, the academia, more than just NASA. It's ESA, JAXA, Canada. It, 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 it's exciting times, Jordan. I agree. We're just blessed we can be in the middle of all of this.
appreciate Barry all the time you gave yeah, us today. Thank absolutely. you so much. And I uh, look forward to talking to you further in the future. I'm looking forward to that. Best of luck. All right, folks. Quite an amazing interview there. A lot of new stuff developing, and we're getting the bleeding edge of it here at the Space Symposium. Got more to bring you, so really exciting stuff still coming. Stay tuned for the next episode. In the meantime, stay angry about space.